Hi, my name is No Gift, and I'm here with uh, two of the authors from uh, the GPT-3 book, and we're going to be talking uh, about some really interesting things today in terms of natural language processing. Uh, I'll let uh, both of the authors uh, introduce themselves. Go for it. Hey, hey everyone. My name is Shabar, and I'm a developer relations specialist at GNI and apart from that, I am also a co-founder of uh, Cairo Data Labs that I started with Sandra. And it covers everything that we are doing with the book. And the aim uh, that we have there is to accelerate innovations at startups and companies with the coming of uh, coming of the East technologies like GP3 and Codex and how they can implement them within their product ecosystem. Yeah, uh, awesome intro. Thank you, Shavam, for uh the beans on Kairos. So I'm Sandra. Uh, I'm ML Teams advocate at Neptune AI. Uh, I am co-authoring the O'Reilly GPT-3 manual book together with Chabam. The title is GPT-3 building uh, NLP products with large language models. We started working on it um, a little bit over six months ago and we are just wrapping up. Very exciting journey. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting us here, and we're happy to uh, talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, uh, well, well, one question I think a lot of people uh, always want to ask author is, why did you want to write a book? That, that might be a good place to start. That's that's really a good question. And the, the story behind this, like, it didn't even start with a book. and We didn't thought of writing a book. Uh, so... Sandra and me both were pretty active in the OpenAI community since the launch of GPT-3, since the launch of API itself in early 2020s. So we have been experimenting a lot. Sandra was creating some very cool videos. She was experimenting with a lot of use cases. And I was writing blogs, creating applications. And so just just uh, one day, one, day uh, one of the editors from Orally, she re reads my blog and she thinks like it's something that is cool that's coming of the age and they, they should have something uh, on that topic. So she reached out and asked like if you would be interested in writing a report. So that's that's how it started. And over months of conversation, it turned out that uh, they, they would be more interested in putting it up as a book. And it has much to do with the technology itself, right? It's a revolutionary technology in itself. It's kind of paradigm shift that we are seeing. And it's it's revolutionary in terms of uh, how it is democratizing the access to AI itself, right? Uh, GB3 is not just another language model. It is something that is actually inviting people from different backgrounds to come in and be the part of this AI revolution. You don't need a technical background anymore to use the cutting edge AI, to use state of the art AI, and to build applications out of that. Uh, I'll, I'll let Sandra speak more about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess I can hop in here because myself, I have no coding background. Uh, I'm a liberal arts major and I actually wanted to be a writer, but more of a novelist when I was uh, studying, but then decided that perhaps this is not a career to pursue um, because it's too, I don't know, emotionally challenging to, to be a writer. So I pushed it aside and pivoted to um, creating startup ecosystem uh, around AI and AI trends. And this is when Shabam approached me and I was uh, in the middle of just like doing the research on GPT-3 and its potential business applications, testing different products that were built with it, talking to founders that have uh, created something really cool with it. And uh, yeah, so uh, he approached me with the opportunity to write the report together on GPT-3 and then it turned into a book and that's how we, that's how we got here. Um, actually, we haven't even seen each other live ever. <laughs> we ah. were working on this book remotely, completely uh, for a couple of months, but Shabam is one of the uh, people that I speak the most to during all this intense uh, project. So we became friends very quickly. So it's really, uh, it's a really cool sign of our times that we can, you know, become collaborators on the, on the book, working from different time zones, different parts of the world. Wow, that is that is a really cool story. <laughs> yeah, I think with with books that one way to to think about them is that it, it's just a good collection of the work you're already doing, and it maybe even a an excuse to maybe push yourself a little bit to 
to do something slightly different or, you know, like it's, it's a, it's almost like running a marathon, you know, like a lot of people at some point they're like, let's run a marathon, you know, and, and you, and you, you train for it and then you run a marathon and then it's like, oh, okay, I did that. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Uh, it, but then the, the, the upside of it also for other people that read your book is that it really could be very helpful. And I agree with both of your points that what's happening with AI and ML right now is that there are many ways to, to use it. And I, I am also with you in terms of, I feel like the uh, broad market is what I'm interested in with AI and ML in terms of not necessarily, I mean, I, I write code every day myself, but I, I honestly am okay with if I never wrote code again, because I'm more, I'm more about solving the problems. And I think there is a really a big opportunity for domain experts to use pre-trained models and just try to solve problems. And, and so I, th I think that's very exciting about what your, what your book is, is focused on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think we both came to the conclusion that we are just scratching the surface at the moment and just like taking a picture of, of this moment in history while the revolution is just starting. But uh, I think we will see many, many more use cases of, um, of GPT-like models um, being introduced to, you know, everyday products that users can interact with, whether it's like chatbots, whether it's um, internet search, um, like it will be much, much more common uh, to have this, uh, not necessarily this model, but other similar models as well as a backbone. So uh, yeah, it's really interesting to observe it and, and see how uh, especially startups experiment with it and try to find different pro problems that it can solve. And also what are the sort of problems with like building a startup around the model itself? Cause it's uh, again, a new thing to have a model as a service and have a company that takes care of all the hosting and everything. So it changes the dynamic um, quite a lot. So uh, yeah. It's really, uh, it's really enjoyable to to experience it sort of firsthand talking to founders. So, so one thing that I've really been thinking a lot about is that uh, I, because I think like a programmer, I always use voice control now. Like I, I use voice control probably, I would say maybe a hundred times a day, probably. I for everything because I have voice control in my car. I have voice control in my house. I, I voice control dictation for notes. Uh, I I look for certain you know things and and I know some people are still slow to to adopt some of the voice control because it's not there perfectly yet with with many of the other devices. But what I suspect is that within let's say five ten years. We, we may hopefully actually much less use uh, the, the screen where, where, where you see everybody in the street and they're just like glued to you the phone and like putting themselves into danger. And, and I, so, so in a way, it, it feels like we are actually right on the cusp of being able to use voice control in a way that could revolutionize in fact, society. So is that something you're also seeing on your end or, or do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah, uh, we, we are already seeing it and especially GP3, right? If we talk about that because we have been researching a lot about that in our book. So if you see like, it's not just voice control, it's about the entire world of virtual beings that it has created, right? Which we, which is popularly known as metaverse these days. And then there are companies like Synthesia who are allowing you to generate uh, AI based videos, which look very similar to what is generated by a human being. So they let you avatarize yourself and you can just create a video just by giving a text script and the third party or the other person won't even realize the difference that this video is generated by AI. A lot of people actually get confused. Like we have run this experiment uh, many times and saw like people uh, are, are not even able to realize like if this video is generated, let's say this po podcast is happening, right? Even if we just give a text script and our avatars, uh, this entire podcast can happen in real time and people won't even know like if I am talking or my avatar is talking. So yeah, we are reaching there. And yeah, it's, it's very amazing to see uh, how these things are changing and how the dynamics are shifting. Yeah, I guess I can comment also on uh, like adding a little bit to what Shabam has said already. Um, 
avatars is one thing, but I think when it comes to the voice command, the the nice thing about it is that it makes the interesting, like makes the interaction with the computer more pleasant, sort of, and and easier, more easygoing. You just you can just like casually talk to your um, Alexa or your or your car or whatever other devices that you're using. Um, and uh, we saw that with GPT three, but I think we can see that uh, even more with Codex uh, at the descendant model of GPT-3 that OpenAI has recently recently uh, launched, that it allows for many many possible applications where uh, it translates it it uh, allows for marriage of natural language, human language, and code, uh, and for many more applications where you will be able to just like directly talk to uh, a given application and achieve some really cool. Uh, result um, in the form of a code, for example. So I don't know, design games, for example, by talking to uh, to your computer. So I definitely see a uh, future for this. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's even a, such a far future. Uh, already there are some like demos of apps uh, being released where, um, you know, they allow you uh, to code with, with, with just your voice. So um, it's, it's a very exciting uh, area that's, uh, evolving yeah i think i think that's another very interesting one too where you know yeah as you mentioned the 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 verbal uh commands to a program uh could be a very interesting way to write software because uh, i i live at the beach part of the year and so i like to take you know like a two-hour walk or four-hour walk just relax talk but it, it but sometimes it would be nice to capture the, the, the time that I'm there and I can imagine you know you're you're walking and you're just writing code right or you're I mean you can write books when you're, you're when you're walking um, but the it, it it seems like even uh, there's so many interesting things about about voice as well that I, I really does feel like we're at the the cusp of a new technology I'll give you one other example um, my I have a two two sons. I have a fifteen year old, and then I have a two. He's about to turn two in, in March, and my my fifteen year old, when he was born, that was I remember the the iPhone just uh, was launched, and I remember you know you know kids get really uh, you know upset when they're one or two, and and we're like oh, just just here's iPhone, just just like you know like <laughs> be quiet for a second, right? Because we're in a restaurant, and he, and he just immediately just like learns it, and then and yeah. then it knows how to do all the voice control, and then my my son, who is two, he sees us talking to all of the smart devices, and, and we have the the Nest uh, Hub, and and we I I mean I set like alarms, I ask for this, I, I'm like I talk to it all day long, I'm just like what about this, what about this, and so my son is just he's watching, and he, and I can see. Like, like it, it's only a matter of time, maybe, you know, I would say like six months from now where he's just going to start talking as well. And he's going to be talking to the device and that opens up a whole other, you know, scenario that, that, because I think when you look at the mind of a, of a child, that's when you see what's going to happen next. And it does feel like that he's very interested in voice communications with devices. Now, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I guess it's... like. Shabon, go, go ahead. Yeah, I guess like that's that's very interesting point that you have brought. Like, if a child is conditioned like that, where he is brought up like from the very early stages, if he or she has seen something like that using voice control and using these kind of applications, so now the the normal question that comes uh, up for them is like this: this all this kind of stuff is very normal. Now, what's next? So, create creativity automatically takes a boost there. Uh, it would be very interesting, very exciting to see what this new generation will come up with when they are already empowered with these kind of tools. Yeah, I think uh, I think we will just uh, see this new generation uh, of, of humans growing uh, very, very accustomed to um, to voice commands <laughs> and also uh, interacting very easily with uh, all sorts of devices. And I, I guess it's natural, like. Um, for example, our uh, our generation interacts a little bit different with the computers than the generation from uh, coming from uh, the time of our grandparents, for example, right? Like it's, uh, I think it's a natural <laughs> progression, and we and we will see very different 
outcomes and modes of uh, existing together with tech uh, at um, at kids especially. So it's I I'm really jealous of your ability to observe it firsthand. <laughs> Uh, I think a uh, ch child's brain, especially when it's developing, it's such a fascinating um, process. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is actually very interesting to, to, to see. I guess it, maybe I have more time to, to see um, this child develop because also the world has changed. I mean, I've, I was working for myself since about 2016. So I, I was a, a little before all of the, the, the complete remote work thing. Um, but it's amazing when you actually have time to spend with your family and work with your family at the same time. Personally, I think it's, it's a huge improvement of, of life. There, there was a, a, I think there was a show on Apple TV I was watching last night called Severance. Have you heard of this show where they they um, the the plot of the movie is that they they basically isolate your work brain from your home your your home life and in the two you you essentially have two different uh, consciousness and and one consciousness is trapped at work and another consciousness <laughs> is 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 at is at home and and it does I think you know if you think about the traditional workplace uh, which I'm not really an advocate of of you live in a high cost city somewhere. And you rent for your whole life, and then you do uh, an hour and a half commute into work, then sit in a cubicle, then go to lunch with people. <laughs> and so you're, you're spending, you know, twelve hours a day, like at, in this other location, versus uh, w the world we're in now, where you can live anywhere, and we have the technology that you can do a you can do things asynchronously as well. It's it opens up a different pattern. I. I personally think the synchronous component of work is often the worst part because you're forced to do things that just really are inefficient but in, in an asynchronous distributed workforce you you have time to actually spend your with your family and i can observe my my son and <laughs> what because i just i'm making trips downstairs oh look, oh look and then i'm seeing what he's doing it's just a different it's just a different form of life so that could be another very interesting you know thing that that could happen as well is that you know sometimes we randomly get things in life that change the world forever and i think covid will change the world forever because it it accelerated the the remote work trend and then we also have have completely um, demystified the fact that you can work um, anywhere. I mean, we, we know that that's works. And then now if you couple that with some of these, these voice technologies, it's like, what could really happen? And could we live in a science fiction world in, in a very quick uh, amount of time? Like, so that's, that's, what's kind of exciting is maybe your book is, is really the timing is, is, is right to, to, to be right on the cusp of a transitional phase of humanity. Just bring, just, just talking out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it's, uh, it's a big pot. <laughs> it's a big pot to, yeah. uh, sort of process, but, uh, yeah, I definitely think that, um, like one, one really exciting thing, uh, about, about GPT-3 and similar models is that it's um, extremely good at processing different kinds of texts and different types of styles of, of texts and being able to uh, emulate different styles and sort of um, uh, get into interaction with humans um, in a specific desired style. So, um, you know, just, uh, just loosely thinking about that, think how, um, how much more pleasant and rich can be our communication with uh, any sort of devices if we just implement these powerful uh, language uh, models, powerful engines behind it. I think uh, it's going to be much much more fun simply. It will give uh, devices more of a personality and it will give us more fun to just uh, hang out and um, you know interact with it. One, one example right now is uh, Replica. I'm not sure if they are currently using uh, GPT-3, but I know that they have, uh, and uh, they have experimented with it at least. And uh, so Replica is this AI friend that uh, tries to learn about you as much as possible through a chat app uh, and uh, asks you all sorts of personal questions, 
uh, remembers all sorts of facts that you uh, share with it and slowly grows to become like your confidant or your mentor or whatever type of relationship you're interested in. Um, yeah, and uh, so when it was powered by GPT-3, um, you could really see how creative it was and you could really see how people were surprised by the you know level of creativity, the level of sort of the human touch that they could get out of it. And there's still, uh, there still a big community using this app just because it's so fun and so um, sort of believable to actually uh, use this chatbot as a personal friend. So um, yeah, it's just one example. I think we can give uh, personality to many more, uh, many more spaces with uh, the models. Um, and adding to your point, as you said, right, uh, we are moving towards space where we can actually live in a sci-fi world because we were talking about voice control and gb 3 actually goes a step beyond that, right? Let's say uh, voice control, with voice control, you can do all the mundane tasks with your voice. But with gb 3 you can do some complex tasks as well just by using your voice. Let's say you want to write an email, you can just ask gb 3 in a single sentence and it can just send the email. Let's say I wake up one day at the morning and I want to remind Sandra about some of the chapters that we, uh, we have to complete and the deadline is approaching. I'll just ask my voice assistant, Alexa or Siri, to send an email to Sandra and remind her that these are the chapters, these are the things that we have to do, and it will properly create an email and send it to her. I mean, this this is what we have currently now. Just think about what, what we can have in the near future with GPT-3 and possibly, possibly GPT-4 approaching uh, uh, near, near us. So the, the possibilities are immense and the things that can happen is again, like coming back to that point, we are just scratching the surface of it. We are, we are not even going deep into what are the possibilities that it can have. Uh, because I guess few days back, I just, uh, uh, I guess you, you also have uh, seen that tweet, tweet, right? By DeepMind, how they are using deep reinforcement learning for uh, nuclear fission reaction. Even like these kind of applications that has potential to completely change the world. Uh, that are, uh, That's also happening with AI. So yeah, the possibilities are immense and we, we are moving towards a future where we, where convenience will be of utmost priority and we can live in abundance actually with all these technologies backing us. So, so with your, with your book, yeah, what would be a good place for people that are both technical or non-technical to, to get started? Because again, I, I really like that approach where, I know there's many people I work with in data science or machine learning or AI pr product management. That's another place I teach in where, where some people, they don't want to be software engineers at all. Uh, so how, how would you explain to them how, how they could read your book and get started? And, and they may not even know what GPT-3 is. Do you have like kind of a, we, we know nothing. How do we get started? Uh, right, right. Yeah. That's that's a really interesting question, and that's what I get a lot. So, if I have to explain someone or uh, coming from a completely non-technical background about what our book is, I'll simply put: it's a book on AI and creativity. It lets you combine artificial intelligence and lets you do creative things with it. You don't need a technical background or technical know-how to understand what this can do. And to put it simply, the vision that we have behind this book is how to reduce the friction between ideas and execution. So right now, let's say you have an idea that that requires AI, uh, AI-based models. You need a technical know-how. You need uh, you need to have that kind of background to build the application, to train the model, to deploy the model, and do all sort of things. But now with GP3, you just have a simple text in text out API. You just go to the playground. Now we don't have a waitlist even. You just log into OpenAI API, go to the playground and just give give uh, give model the instructions just like you give it to a human. Just tell the model, hey, I want to write an email. It will write an email. Hey, I want to create a chatbot. It will create a chatbot. And you can do all sort of things just by uh, giving instructions to model in a simple English language. It's as easy as that. Uh, it's as easy as possible. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, adding to that, um, we've, we basically wrote the book uh, having in mind that people with different backgrounds will be reading it and that's, that was our desired outcome. So anybody 
uh, with any level of knowledge in the tech field can uh, somehow find something valuable for themselves in the book. Uh, and we really, really try to both give uh, a solid but very simple and clear introduction into what GPT-3 is, where it comes from, why is it a revolutionary step in, in the space. And then we um, look at different types of tasks that it can do. And then we talk to people that have already done something with it. So um, even if you're not a technical person, even if you're not interested in necessarily building something with it, you can have a nice overview of the A, where it comes from, and B, the ecosystem surrounding it. So what sort of or sorts of products are being built? What do these founders uh, are discovering uh, right now? What kind of use cases do they uh, tackle? What does... Um, an investor think about this trend as uh, as a you know potential potential investment space. We we talk to all sorts of uh, ecosystem stakeholders um, and also look at uh, some controversies around it, some risks associated with it. So I think um, no matter what you're looking for, whether you're looking for like a practical guide into actually learning how to build with it or just like getting a gr grasp of what it is, um, I think it's a really starting point and that's how we that's how we wanted it to be and and one one thing I th it sounds like both of you are interested in startups I've worked in startups a, a lot of my life and I, I I've gotten a little bit away from them because the uh, for for various reasons I, I'm spending more time teaching but the one one issue that I have noticed in the Bay Area, living there for ten years, is there there seems to be like a culture of, I guess, libertarianism, which is uh, I, I feel like is a, probably the best uh, person who would be the the poster child for libertarianism would be Peter Thiel, and you, and you see uh, he's uh, now. Uh, backing trump candidates in in the u.s and and uh he's he's very excited about you know you know all, all of the all of this kind of stuff and, and it, it seems like that that's another really interesting thing we're gonna have to address with with the uh, startups is uh so my my opinion is that we we could do things where there's more of like an organic technology startup system versus regular so like if you look at the food supply system many people want to buy organic food because they don't want pesticides and like forced labor and, and or they want to buy by um you know fair trade food where their people weren't uh, paid unfair wages that i think many consumers want to pay more money for have having a higher quality uh food right or or, or products like coffee i, I know i do I, I would much rather only work with companies that aren't necessarily libertarian i feel like that's not what I, my values i want to i want people to uh, be treated fairly uh, i want stakeholders out other than just the shareholders to 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 be be taken into account like you know are we are we putting pollutants into the environment or you know creating fossil fuels <clears throat> all those kinds of things so it feels like ai in particular excuse me one second <clears throat> that AI in particular is is really a, a, it's a very interesting space because if if we don't do it right then unscrupulous people are going to own it and then they're they're going to do what they just did right we just saw what happened with Facebook you know uh, Spotify people just tell people not to take vaccines make money off of it create hoaxes and there's no repercussions, really. I mean, Mike, Mark Zuckerberg is one of the richest people on earth and just no repercussions. He just did uns unscrupulous things. So with AI and ML in the startup space, you know, do you think there is an opportunity for like a reset where, where we, there could be like a different set of values where still, you know, people are making money, they're, they're, they're you know, creating products, but just like how there's two kinds of food at the grocery store, there's the food that's like, well, this might be full of poison. Uh, and, then, and then there's other food. It's like, well, this actually probably isn't have poison. That do you think there could be a place, especially for things like GBT, where there's like an organic, you know, tech startup for for AI and ML. 
definitely definitely i mean uh, so if you see like uh, responsible ai and ai safe safety is one of the burgeoning fields that we are seeing these days and open ai itself to employ a lot of people just to take care of data privacy data security and ai safe safety side of things and even if you go to the open ai documentation there is a list of things that you need to go through before you put your application or uh, before your application go live you have to follow certain set of guidelines and it should shouldn't do any harm it shouldn't uh, uh, have a text of violence it shouldn't create any hatred and all these things like these are just the number of things that's on top of my head but there is a set of guidelines that they have that they follow there's proper terms of use documentations and we do even touch all of these in our book as well and try to convey it in the form of case studies right uh the products that have built and how they need to be within these guidelines when you when you build something with uh, gp3 and that's one of the most uh, uh interesting thing that we saw with open ai they, they are from from the very early stage from the inception they are very concerned about ai safety and responsible ai and many of the startups that are that are coming the, uh, coming of these days they they are spec uh, especially particular about these things on how to keep it safe how to uh, how to keep the data private secure and it shouldn't uh, be like that that anybody and everybody can access the data of, of one client and it shouldn't it shouldn't uh, leak here and there so yeah it's a burgeoning field uh, and it's it's a growing uh, topic it's a growing interest but right now what i see where we are is uh, it's still in the development phase people don't uh, still realize that difference which you can spot in food right you can spot like this is a organic food and this is a normal food and this is the one that i should buy uh, so that kind of interest it, it will still take some time for people to understand about responsible ai and ai safety and why these are important uh, it exists and it's growing but still we we it will take few more years for people to completely understand what this actually means and the kind of impact it can have in the long term future Yeah I would add to that that um it's it's quite heartwarming uh to observe all the initiatives OpenAI has already taken in order to make their models as safe as toxic less um you know as e- equality driven as possible uh the thing is that once the transformers have been born we haven't really understood how they are working we haven't really understood what are the potential downsides of these models we haven't understood how to curate data sets so that they aren't skewed you know to begin with because the problem starts with the data sets um often times and we are discovering it now and openai introduced a number of mechanisms that allowed them to test um and see what are the potential problems and then address them. So first of all they introduced the beta so only invited people could um access the platform. They are also um creating guidelines guidelines for what kind of uses uh are allowed with with this technology and then they are also monitoring whether um that's actually the case and whether the end users don't um ab- abuse certain applications for example. So uh there are all sorts of mechanisms on all these levels to make sure that these models are as safe as possible having said that this is yeah i just like shabam mentioned working progress and we will um we have many many more uh, problems to solve but uh it's really interesting to see that sort of all this all this backlash coming from uh, the tech field generally is um informing the leaders in this fields to do better and to actually uh take precautions before they even launch products and before they they give it to the world so yeah i would say it's we are in this space we are much smarter thanks to that uh we we learn from the experience yeah the the i've actually been thinking about this a lot in the last several years that the way i i could break down the ethical framework is that there are uh you know essentially three fa- three types of uh things that you could describe for a company you could be a company is either positive neutral or negative in terms of their impact on humans and so i would call this you know are you h- harming humans at scale so if we look at for example facebook is a great example 
they they propagated uh, the the Sandy Hook hoax for I think close to a decade. So so parents who the, you know their their kids were murdered, they Facebook was uh, monetizing uh, the harassment of the parents. That that's to me uh, that's harming humans at scale, right? That that that's a very easy example, right? Or that Spotify is a, another good example. You know they have Joe Rogan amongst other people telling people. I mean, I, and I watched the episode, like kids shouldn't get vaccines. Like, well, you're harming humans at scale, right? Like very simple and you're monetizing it. So it feels like that's a, so simple to, to, to just break down as an ethical framework. Do you harm humans at scale? Yes or no. So Spotify, Facebook, yes. Right. And then there's neutral, like Disney channel, like, well, is it helpful to watch Star Wars or Boba Fett or or Mandalorian, like, eh, it's neutral, right? Neutral. And then you have positive where there are companies that are really, you know, helping humanity or, and they're they're doing good stuff and they're still profitable. I think a good example would be Patagonia where the, the core values of the company is that, you know, they want to make, you know, sustainable products and all. So so that that's kind of where I'm getting at is that it, it's, it seems, in my opinion, so simple for, for AI companies to to be very, very specific. It's not complicated. Do you harm humans at scale? They could say that. They could say like, our AI products do not harm humans at scale. They can just be neutral. Say, we, we don't hurt people. We don't make money off of hurting people, right? And 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 that would be, I think, if for startups, that's, what, that's one of the things I'm trying to evangelize is, is that you'll make way more money by by not by telling people I don't har harm humans at scale. So hopefully with the the GPT three and all the stuff that's happening, there will be some startups to say no, we're going to make we're going to be very specific about this. We're helping humanity. We we you know. And I think another one is uh, that's a, that's a, that's kind of a, a dicey one. Is uh, I was at uh, Tesla. They invited me over a few months ago to go to Palo Alto and. On one hand, I think it's amazing some of the technology they created with, I have their like battery backup system, which is pretty cool. And I like that the, their cars, you know, are, are like have lo lots of range and, you know, they're clean energy. But then it's like, oh, you had to let me down. Like the, 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 our, you could say, you know, if pedestrians are walking across the street and they're, they didn't sign a, a, re a release to say, I'm part of your, your autonomous driving test, are you, aren't you harming humans at scale? Like, I think you are. Like, like I mean, you, you, like that unfortunately fails the test for me. So, so it feels, it feels like we're really at this phase now with where, where that's, that's one of the things that I'm trying to, to, to promote is that it, it feels like many customers would love to spend more money for a product and be, because they would feel good about the AI product that they're, they're buying. So I don't know. That, that's my thought on the, on the, the ethics of it. Like one thing I can think of is that um, it is a little bit challenging to be um, good, non-harming, contributing to the benefit of humanity from the get-go if you don't exactly know what this technology is capable of and sort of where, where its edges, where it's safe. And I think... Um, um, at the beginning with GPT-3, there were lots of tests being uh, done in order to find out like how people interact with it, what sort of outputs this model generates, why does it generate certain outputs, why does it tend to be more misogynistic than you know you would like it to be, and how to fix it. So, um, like it, um, we had to go through certain steps in order to be able to say, okay, this model is now safe in order to be released uh, in into the public space. And um, I think um, another part is that you you also need to, while, while, while you're developing something, you need to give it a go and see how it will actually interact with the real world. And sometimes you cannot predict that. So um, I'm not sure what's Tesla's case, but I'm sure that uh, it's really different to, for example, train a computer vision algorithm to watch out for pedestrians and very different to actually uh, have it run in the real world and how the how this data uh, differs and how how it informs the decision making making of the software. So um, yeah, I mean th there is this tension that on the one hand you want to keep it as safe as possible, but on the other you also need to let it run for for a while and observe how it behaves and then learn from it. So 
um, yeah, it's it's a challenge to figure out a good balance uh, between between these things. But I I very much agree uh, well, with you as well. Well, I, I would say the, the you know in, in all of these situations that I also am, am a huge fan of you know moving fast and you know all all, all that stuff. But it, let, let's take Tesla for example, because I, when I was with Tesla, I, I actually told this to the engineers. I said, "What if you just had a, a new road?" What if you just build a road that's just for Teslas, right? Like the, you, you could solve you. You could essentially eliminate the risk to people that didn't sign up to be a, a, a you know, part of the experiment, right? Like, so it isn't like it's not possible to to have a, an autonomous vehicle that would eliminate the externality of the pedestrians or the other vehicles. You 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 could do it because people could they could build their own private highway, and the private highway would only have Teslas on it, only people that agreed to do a Tesla. Now, would that be more expensive? Yes, it would. <laughs> would Would your product be slightly less compelling? It would. So, uh, so I think that's a good example. And I think the same with, uh, if you look at companies like Facebook or, or, or let's take Facebook, for example, it's like, oh, we can't stop misinformation. Well, you know, actually you could. Just people can't create comments. People can't create post comment content to Facebook anymore. That's it, right? It just turns off. No, no content can be created. And maybe there's like some huge vetting process where there's like, you know, it takes like six months to get vetted and then there's rules. You, uh, you could do this, right? You could stop all misinformation on Facebook. Now, how much less money would they make? But if Facebook, instead of being a $500 billion company, maybe they're 5 billion. Well, the world would be, would be better. But then one person who just bought uh, a third of of, of Kauai, maybe he can't buy a third of a Kauai. Maybe he can only buy like a house on Kauai. <laughs> so, so I, I think I think that's the the the, the real interesting thing is that, in, in my opinion, th there always is a, a way that you can have a profitable company, especially if you say that the growth and and user retention and all this isn't the the number one priority. You could say we want to create a profitable company. We're okay with growing slower because we respect so much, you know, help har you know humans that help not harming humans at scale. So, so I hope that the AI people are are, are really thinking about this. Yeah. So, like one example that we have is uh, AI Dungeon. In in case of GPT three, I'm not sure if you're familiar with with the story, but um, basically. No. Um, a Dungeon is this RPG character game where it uses GPT-3 to generate text-based adventure games. And you're you're able to create all sorts of characters, all sorts of environments, and just like play um, with, with text. Um, and um, so awesome use case, very creative, and people use it for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but then what happened um, a little bit, like few months into the launch of the company was that they discovered that uh, a lot of the users are actually using this game for creating pornographic content and uh, the one that's not ethical. And uh, OpenAI very quickly reacted because they were able to also observe it uh, and uh, just uh, required it th this specific use case to uh, be completely, uh, in to not be possible with introducing lots of filters and just, uh, you know, observing how users interact with the, with the app. Um, on a daily basis. And uh, yeah, I guess it's one of these stories where, um, again, like you need to let it out in order to see how people interact with it. But then once you observe something that's concerning, you actually make a stand and uh, decide that, okay, this is where the line is and we don't care about monetization, we care about the better world. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. And uh, adding to what Sandra just said, right? Uh, with large language models like GP3, the thing is, we still don't completely understand how these models actually work. Let's say if you give a certain input, the output you're going to get will change dynamically over time. With, with a little bit difference in, uh, difference in input, you'll get a completely different output. And that's what happened with AI Dungeon. So it started on a positive note, and then people tried with different uh, tried giving different input prompts, and it, it opened a completely different world. It generated completely random sort of things. And then it evolved into a different use case altogether. So the thing with these models is you cannot predict <clears throat> what it can do because the possibilities are endless. So it's it's very hard to restrict it 
from doing harm or from like putting it a putting a proper filter to it or putting a proper measure that you can like stop it consistently stop people from uh, doing any bad activities or doing any harm but open ai did came up uh, with a content filtering model after all these use cases which actually avoids uh, generating harmful content and even if it generates harmful content even if it's not a harmful content it has some words to it that indicates it might be harmful you'll get a warning in the playground itself or in the api output itself like this is a harmful content you should be aware before reading it so i i personally am very impressed by the efforts they put they didn't had to put this content filtering model it doesn't add anything to the output of gpt or to the capabilities of gpt it's just a, a extra added feature just to ensure ai safety and response towards responsible ai so that's that's a really commendable step from open ai uh, but again like going back we need to propagate the uh, the subject of ai ethics and responsible ai to the people who are using it to the startups who are building the product because uh, open ai can control it to a certain extent right uh, at the end it's all about the end user how they want to use it and how what are the kind of inputs they give to the model because the model in itself is so big so powerful and train uh, train over such a large data set it can just mix up anything and everything and can come up with all sort of outputs so it's it's the basic responsibility of the people that are using it as you correctly mentioned right you need to be ethically responsible while you're building something with gpt3 or any kind of language model because it doesn't Im- impact the current society that we live in it will have a much longer impact uh, a long lasting results or long lasting impact that will necessarily affect generations what what you build today or the standards that you set today will, is going to affect uh, uh, f- uh, much longer in the future so it's it's high time that we start thinking about these issues and set up proper structure and open ai has taken step in the direction so if you see all the other alternatives of gp3 like Co- cohere and eleuther they follow the same steps right they they introduce the same terms of service they introduce the uh, same guidelines they have to follow because open ai has already set up that standard you cannot just go ahead and just open everything up and now data privacy data security ai ethics have become a norm because these people have already introduced it so all the other products other alternative models that's coming after that they are already following it and it's it's really good to see that that we are moving towards a society where people are more conscious about how they use these kind of models these aren't just uh, ai models that that you can use for any kind of product but they they are more conscious about how they are using it and the kind of output it generates and the impact that it will have in the society yeah that's 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 good to hear that that gives me some reassurances <laughs> for because it if it, it feels so simple in some ways where if we it's true that you can't always anticipate all of the uses of a technology like dynamite i think was a good example right was it um was it alfred noble that created the the first dynamite stick and then he felt bad about it so he created the nobel prize same with uh einstein and others research on you know the uh the atoms and the harnessing the power of of atoms and then it's like whoa wait why are we creating bombs <laughs> you know so so there 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 are situations like that but it, as long as the people that are the the smart people that are involved in it like you know you two and other people who are who are like the thought leaders are 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 able to adapt and say hey you know we're we're not okay with this These, this is not what you do and you adjust to it it seems like all of these bad tech companies they could have just adjusted right they could have just said listen we're not going to do this we're this this is this is hurting people we're not going to let you put hoaxes on facebook you know it's wrong it's 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 morally wrong we won't do it but so i think that's really the trick is it seems like it's it's just the, the it's the values of the the thought leaders and the and the tech leaders and the startup leaders either they they believe in this and they want to make the world a better place or they don't and and you <laughs> and and that that's kind of what kind of world do we live in do we live in a bad world or do we live in a world where you know like a good science fiction world where there's all these really awesome things happening and humanity's uh you know able to use things like gpt3 i guess like it's it's all about what you set up as a norm right because good and bad is always the same side of a coin 
and with innovation the good will happen and with in a, in the same way it will all, also invite the bad things then you have to understand by right, which direction you want to go to even even as a even as a company uh, like open ai or eluter or cohere who is develop, who are developing these kind of models it's it's also their responsibility it's also their moral ethical responsibility to set up these kind of guidelines to set up uh, these kind of uh, these kind of structure that the people who are going to use their products are more conscious about how how they are going to use it to set up a norm how it looks like uh, a norm for ai ethics a norm for responsible ai a norm where using these models uh, uh for bad purposes is not accepted at all so that's that's the kind of society of world we should strive towards building and we should aim for building because we have learned a lot from these past experiences right we have been talking about all the mess that has happened with the big tech facebooks of the world and all these things uh, because technology in itself is so attractive that the bad use cases automatically propel and it's very easy to it's it's very easy to get to them right the good come the good always comes later uh, the bad use cases comes up very easily and it's very easy to come up with those so it's it's our moral responsibility as well as the responsibility of the people who are inventing or creating these kind of products yeah i would also add a little bit about like the responsibility of a user because in the case of ai dungeon for example like the the founders in their use case that those like super creative storytelling um type of game use case and like they wouldn't really encourage any sort of child pornography imagery on their platform they would they wouldn't really uh, that that wasn't absolutely where they wanted to um, to go with the platform, but then the users uh, were able to interact freely with the model, and they took it in that dark corner. So it's also about it, it's a reflection of us humans and like how we interact with this tech and what kind of you know moral values we hold when when we do it. Maybe we should start thinking more in terms of sort of etiquette in in etiquette and like moral compass in interactions with ai rather than just like um use it as a sort of dark internet corner where you can just like dump all sorts of uh things to it and then expect that uh, expect a good outcome i mean it it won't happen for sure so it's also on us people that are interacting with these um products to actually want to have a nicer better world without any sort of um you know th things like what happened with a dungeon great well I, I think that's a great uh segue for maybe just talking a little bit more about your book in terms of like wh wh where can when can people buy the book it sounds like i think many people would want to buy your book w when is it going to be released so uh, we are uh, we we are planning for the uh, release end of May. Uh, we are already wrapping up, writing the very very last sub chapters, and now are working intensely with the editor, trying to save as much of of the book as possible. <laughs> uh, and it will be available on O'Reilly platform, but it will be also in the book form, so you will be able to. I think you can already like pre um, pre purchase it on all sorts of bookstores, Amazon, etc. Ah, so 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 basically, uh, the people if they have subscription to O'Reilly uh, can read I think th at least three chapters, right? The era of large uh, language models using uh, the o OpenAI API, and then also uh, programming with GPT three. Right? I think those are the three chapters, and then if they want to pre-order. They can pre-order now. One and actually, if you are interested in this topic, it probably is a good idea to pre-order sooner than later. I've noticed that books I've written sometimes you, if you, especially with the way the world is right now with uh, shortages of uh, supply chain, that it's it's better to be in the front of the queue <laughs> so that you can you can get the book as quick as possible. So that might be something that people would would want to consider is, is a pre-order sooner than later so that you, you don't have to wait an extra month to get the book. Yeah. Uh, we also invite you to uh, follow our YouTube channel, Kairos Data Labs, because we are releasing some uh, resources before even the book will be fully published, uh, such as interviews with the, with the 
AI ecosystem. As I mentioned, we're we're introducing quite some in interviews, so we will be publishing it there. And we also have some uh, additional learning materials for people that want to start, you know, building apps with GPT-3 or just like creating their own sort of uh, relationship and like educational path with them. So uh, yeah, check it out. Cool. Yeah. So so the YouTube channel um, is there. It, I guess you can post that in I, I guess say it say it one more time so 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 people know what it is it's what is it called again it's called Kairos Data Labs the channel Kairos Data Lab yeah and we can send you a link after yeah. after our conversation so we can add it to yep. the call perfect in any other place that people can can reach you uh LinkedIn um websites yeah, they, they can reach us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. We are pretty active there, and we, we are always uh, putting some snippets, threads out there on Twitter uh, from the book from and talking all things about GP3, no code, and this versioning ecosystem, as well as they can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we also have a Kairos page on LinkedIn where we put in all these updates, some interesting insights that we come up with, and all the new things that we are doing in the book. Great. Well, yes, uh, I, I'll add to that that Shofam is also a really good author of a Medium blog, so you can follow him there for, for more uh, content on AI. And I myself have a YouTube channel uh, exploring different types of AI trends as well, so you can check me out there as well. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think many people are going to be interested in your content, and I, I think also the it's just good to have a conversation with you and find out you know, some of your ideas about what's going to happen in the future. And Amaya, I really learned a lot and appreciated your time, you know, talking with me and, and uh, very excited to, to get a copy of your book. I'll definitely, I'll definitely be ordering a copy. Thanks so Thank much you. for Thank having us. So this was, was a big pleasure to uh, talk a little bit about it, even if it's still in the making. So uh, thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye-bye.